This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. We're back. We're live. We're here. It's 3 o'clock rock here in Honolulu, but we are connected by Skype to our guest, who is Lucian Puyarisi. He is the, um, the CEO, president of uh, EPRINC, which is an energy policy research organization, think tank in Washington, D.C. And we're going to talk about energy in America uh, today, namely with respect to what happened in Irma and what happened in, in Harvey. Welcome again to the show. Nice to have you here, Lou. Good to be here, Jay. So, Lou, um, you know, we had some pretty serious storms in the last couple, three weeks. Uh, and um, as a result, uh, there were disruptions in supply of fuel and energy. And it's ironic looking at it from Hawaii's point of view because Nextera is Florida Power and Light. Nextera was trying to buy Hawaiian Electric. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and everybody was expecting they would be able to lay lots of capital into mm -hmm. uh, upgrading the grid and this and that. Mm -hmm. And now uh, they have their own he headache, don't they, in Florida? <laughs> Absolutely. And we should talk about uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, when you have a large event like this, a storm, plus a two in a row, first Harvey, which moved into the Gulf Coast and literally shut down almost uh, well over a third of U.S. refining capacity, uh, shut out power, disrupted pipelines, followed by Irma, which had very large consequences to the power sector, particularly in Florida. So one of the things I'd like to talk about today is, um, first, what happens? You know, what, what does the, all the instruments of government and industry do when one of these storms uh, hit? And how are, why are these measures very important, these responses? Because some of these responses are not physical logistics. They are policy. Mm -hmm. Relief of the Jones Act, changing mm -hmm. gasoline standards. Oh, yeah. So we could, let's talk, we'll talk a little bit about that. And, but first I'd like to start with uh, slide number one, which is a sort of cartoon, it's a map of Florida. And the reason I picked Florida, not only did it get hit very hard by the second storm, and I don't know, is, is, the, is the image up there? Yes, it is. Yeah, so you can see, one thing to think about Florida is it relies extensively, not just on pipelines, but shipment by uh, seaborne tankers and barges. So like the Hawaiian Islands, it has to get its fuel not just by pipeline from other parts of the country, but by uh, tankers and barges. And that means that when you have a hurricane and the ports are interrupted, mm -hmm. uh, you also have a huge surge in the demand for seagoing uh, vessels. Mm -hmm. But the United States has a policy requiring shipment from one U.S. port to another to use only American flag tankers, mm -hmm. the so-called Jones Act. Mm -hmm. So the first thing the government does, and they did in this emergency, was to relieve the requirement to use a Jones Act tanker. So I think that's very important. You think about for the Hawaiian Islands, if you are serviced by facilities from the U.S. that cannot be served by foreign flag tankers. It must be served by American flag tankers. But in an emergency, the surge in demand for those tankers can just take off, and there's not enough capacity. Mm -hmm. So the first thing the government needs to do is to waive that, and they have mm -hmm. to do it quickly. And this, and this is not a statutory in thing. In other words, Congress does not have to act. This can be done on the executive branch. Right? Absolutely. Homeland Security has the authority. DOE and Homeland Security acting together have the authority. Mm -hmm. the another, another big instrument that happens is that in the U.S. we have these uh, what we call boutique fuels. So different parts of the country have something called reformulated gasoline or reed vapor pressure. And the, the point is, is they want to, uh, lots of parts of the country are subject to uh, they're more, you know, more leaning, smog is more prevalent. Mm -hmm. And one way to deal with that is to produce gasoline which has lower uh, volatile organic compounds. Mm -hmm. And that's called this reed vapor pressure. Mm -hmm. But in an emergency, you need to move fuel all around the country. Mm -hmm. right? 
And uh, to do that, some parts of the uh, country can't use the fuel in other parts. But if you waive the regulations, all the automobiles can use it. Mm -hmm. So the second thing the government did was to relieve these local, some of the federal requirements for uh, what's called rebate RVP, or the production of a formulated gasoline. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you need to do in emergency is sort of simplify the fuel specifications across the country so the logistics can be served, sourced from anywhere. And second, you need to uh, open up the transportation system on the regulatory side. Mm -hmm. So I would say both those actions, which were done quickly by FEMA, the Homeland Security, and the Department of Energy, helped to relieve this uh, you know, this crisis. Yeah. But it strikes me that you've got to do those things in order to get the fuel, you know, delivered to the affected area. And if you wait on those things, then the shipments wait, uh, and then we have another problem. And, you know, I I think what people don't realize is it has to come from some distance. It has to be taken by by truck or by, uh, by ship, I suppose. Uh, and, and brought into the area. And if, if that's get, that gets held up, um, the whole thing is exacerbated. Right. Of course, and gasoline prices have gone up. They went up an average of uh, somewhere, sometimes as much as 40 cents. But they're already beginning to come back down a bit. Mm-hmm. And I haven't looked at the data for the Hawaiian Islands, but you know, if you take out 3.2 million barrels a day, of U.S. capacity, which is about a third of U.S. capacity. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a small percentage of world capacity, probably less than 5%. Mm -hmm. But if you remove that much capacity for producing refined products, you're going to affect the world price of gasoline, the world price of diesel fuel. And one of the things we ought to look at, uh, maybe I'll send you a note later, is what happened to gasoline prices in Hawaii yes. throughout the, over the last uh, 10 days? Yes, and, and I would not be surprised if they were up a good 20 cents. Well, we, when we talked to uh, Jeff Kissel about this uh, two weeks yeah, ago, yeah. Uh, he's also with Eprink, yeah. um, he, uh, he was looking back at um, Katrina, uh, where mm-hmm. Katrina had an effect, of course, uh, on the mainland, Louisiana. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it had a secondary effect on prices in Hawaii. Um, and not only for gasoline, but all commodities that were in mm-hmm. short supply in that area. So I imagine the same process will always happen when you have one part of the country that's affected in short supply, we here in Hawaii will suffer because the resources are not available to us. Right, and I think that the other thing I am concerned about, but I, that it's too early to tell, is these two storms and the sequence that came so close together, they may actually have a fundamental effect on the national economy. And I wouldn't be surprised if we end up at the end of the year uh, losing anywhere from a half to maybe a whole percentage point of GNP. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully we can make some of this up and it won't be that bad, but you know, we we, we have really restored a lot of growth in the national economy, running around 2.8%. And I think there was a good chance to raise that up to three and a half. So we, we may not be able to do that now because of the, these, these a, a lot of product, a lot of productivity has been, you know, really hammered into the ground. Yeah. But on that point, let me ask you, and I'm really curious about this. So you have a storm, you have, mm-hmm. you know, destruction and people aren't going to be able to work. There's no productivity happening for a while mm, until yeah. they get it together. But then you go into a phase where everybody is rebuilding. Uh, they're rebuilding you know, what was broken, what was destroyed, damaged, and uh, trying to get back to normal. And, but they're doing it on an expedited basis. They're doing it faster than they would normally do. So do you find, actually, when you make this kind of analysis, Lou, that there's a period of time where it's really low product productivity, but then when they rebuild, it's higher than normal because they're working right. so hard to rebuild. This is a classic problem in economics called the broken window problem. Right? Mm. The idea is uh, it's not so bad if someone breaks your window because then you go out and you buy some new glass and put it in. <laughs> but that's actually not a really good way to think about this problem. <laughs> the resources you put into replacing that broken window could have gone into more productive things. So you're really not better off if you blow up a lot of the country's housing and people go back to work. Now, we have a 
you know, I, I think these two storms can easily come in anywhere between 100 and $150 billion in damage. Who knows what the real number is? And we have a 10, we have a 12, 10, 12 trillion dollar economy, whatever it is. So we can absorb this loss as long as we don't get a lot more of these. And uh, hopefully it will not be a big loss. But we are worse off if a lot of our productive stock gets uh, damaged. Yeah, multiple broken windows, as it were. Right, right. Well, let's, let's pause on that point, too, because, you know, uh, from the scientific community, uh, we can get in the, getting the message that climate change is, is bad and getting worse. And we right. have some indication of that in all these storms. Well, uh, we're going to talk about that at the end of this, uh, end of this event today. Uh, if, but uh, before we move on, let's go to uh, the next uh, sure. slide. Uh, I wanted to sh also show you something which is quite, to me, quite interesting. The pace at which they were able to restore power in Florida was also quite good in Texas. But So if you see the first slide here, I mean, you see number two. This shows you the state of power outages in Florida on September 12th, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you can see that it, it, by the colors, anywhere from 50 to 60 to 70% of the state was without power mm -hmm. on this day. Mm -hmm. And you think about Florida, it's not a, you know, it's the fourth largest, uh, I think it's the maybe the fourth largest economy among the states in the US, maybe the third largest population. But that's a devastating result. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go to the next page, uh, page three, and look at uh, uh, power outages, one of the amazing things about this is the ability to move large numbers of repairmen and repair women into the region quickly. As much as 60,000 people moved into Florida, linemen, uh, electricians, uh, all kinds of construction experts. And this is actually something to think about for the Hawaiian Islands because the ability to move a large number of people into the Hawaiian Islands quickly is probably not that great. You know? right. But in Florida, lots of different routes. And if you look at this chart here, you can see that if you compare Wilma with uh, Irma, mm -hmm. yes, uh, uh, Irma was worse. But within, you know, within five days, less than... Yeah, within five days, less than 10% uh, of the population was, uh, you know, out of, without power. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's a remarkable resilience of the U.S. system. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's going to happen now is we're going to get a lot of post-storm studies on distributed power. How did wind and solar hold up versus the rest of the grid? Yes. That's going to be very interesting. Do you have any indication of that yet? Do you have any early numbers on some, that? Some of the numbers suggest the wind, the wind didn't do too well. <laughs> sure. Some well, of the wind you're talking about over 100 miles an uh, hour. It's going to break and something. And, of course, some of the distributed power, uh, the solar, the, P, uh, the photovoltaics on the rooftops also took a big hit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it strikes me that uh, in, the, in the case of wind, um, you can build a really strong turbine but if the wind comes at you know high speeds, it's it's going to break the turbine. In the yeah, case in the case of solar cells, yeah. you can you can really anchor them down well. Yes, uh, like yeah. for earthquake yeah. kind you know uh, res resilience, and uh, you can probably do more to protect a solar cell than a windmill uh, against a hurricane like this. No. Yes, but you know the if you have the if these uh, cells are exposed right outside to the elements. Uh, yeah. But the advantage of them is they don't need to be hooked up. I mean, you're right there. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I, I think we need to take a look at the data after the storm as it comes in. Yeah, and that's, I think that's one element uh, we have to learn by this. Mm -hmm. um, everything that happens is a lesson. Um, and yeah. Not necessarily an opportunity, but at least a lesson. Let's take a short break. Uh, this is Lou Pugliarisi. Uh, here on Energy in America. He's with APRINC, and we're talking about what we can learn uh, from Harvey and, and Irma uh, going forward and how it, they affected Hawaii. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. 
Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! Guys, don't forget to check me out right here at the Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all of that great stuff. Thank you. you. Remember. We're back. We're live with Lou Pugliarisi oh, oh. here on Energy in America. He's the CEO of EPRINC in Washington, joins us by Skype. So, um, yeah, uh, after our break here, Lou, you wanted to cover some points about climate change and what we can learn about that and, and how that yeah. alter, interacts with our planning. So, you know, we've talked about this many times in the past. So uh, the question of adaption versus, uh, you know, versus uh, prophylactic measures to deal with, you know, reducing CO2 emissions. And one thing I, we should say before we go is that I don't know if you remember in the first Iraq, uh, the first Gulf War, when the Iraqis moved in and they like set on fire all these oil wells in mm -hmm. Kuwait, mm -hmm. all the analysts estimated it was going to take two, three years to shut them down. But people often underestimate the value of learning. Yes. And the well, the, the the workers in the fields will learn quickly how to do it better and faster. And what was predicted to be a three-year job turned into an eight-month job. Mm -hmm. So, and I think in Florida, if you that chart we looked at earlier is, we're getting very good at figuring out. Two, two things are coming out of Florida very early. One is the new building codes appear to be working. Ah, that's great news. The new building codes they've had tremendous resilience. The newer homes are doing much better than the older homes, mm -hmm. particularly attachment of roofs, uh, building them higher. Lots of different measures, uh, ability to withstand uh, uh, flying debris and all these things. So that we're going to have to, and that should be studied very carefully. That's Those are very good lessons for Hawaii. By very way. relevant to Hawaii yeah. because it was just a couple of months ago that Governor Ige signed the new building code statute, which updated uh, our building code, which hadn't been updated in quite some time, and uh, largely for energy efficiency, but other things too. So this yeah. is really good news, that the modern technology in building codes actually helps you become more resilient in storms. Yeah, so before we look at, uh, uh, before we go to the next slide, a big theme that comes out of this, uh, these recent storms is that this is really the result of CO2 loadings and climate, right? Mm -hmm. But do the data support that view? So let's go to the next slide for, this shows the U.S. flood damage as a percent of GDP. You can't just look at, uh, you know, the economy gets bigger, more people move into the coastline, you know, so what you want to do is look at what percentage of the, the wealth of the national economy is hurt by floods over time. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this data from 1940 to 2012, right, it shows that the amount of flood damage in the U.S. as a proportion of GDP has actually declined. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that could be is that people are smarter how they build facilities. I don't actually think it means that uh, less people are moving into flood zones. That's People love to live in the, in the wetlands close to the ocean, mm -hmm. and we've had a lot of buildup in coastal, mm -hmm. coastal communities. When I, I used to, by the way, my, when I was in the Navy, I used to fly with the hurricane hunters. Mm -hmm. And we had two problems. One is uh, we weren't so good in those days at predicting where it would land, and we would predict it would land at X and it would land at Y, and people who boarded up and it didn't appear, they would not board it up the second time. So there's a problem with <laughs> uncertainty. Human nature. <laughs> and the other thing is we had a lot of big storms in the 60s and the, in the 60s and 70s. But when they landed in coastal areas, nobody was living there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if we go to the next slide, it's very interesting. 
do we have an increase in the incidence of hurricanes in the historical data? Actually, in the climate models, I think what they show is that you get an increase in weather temperature, probably you will get fewer storms, but they will be more intense. Right? Yes. But the data does not show that hurricanes, at least from 1900 to 2013, if you can take a look at this, if you look at U.S. hurricane landfalls from 1900 to 2013, there is no, actually there's a slight decline over that period of time. Mm -hmm. But most people don't realize is we've had about 12 years now where the, everybody in the Florida Gulf Coast, you know, we've had a couple of storms, but largely we've escaped all the major storms. They have all spun out to sea. Mm -hmm. So this once again gets back to the question of what's the most effective strategy for climate? How much should we put into adaption? How much should we put into reducing our CO2 footprint? You know, on that, on that point, there was one really interesting piece on uh, National Public Radio, and that was that although <clears throat> uh, this storm was a Category 5, uh, mm -hmm. I guess I'm thinking about uh, the one, uh, Irma, um, yeah. the, the temperature on the ocean surface was a couple of degrees higher than it used to be. And that, that's pro probably global warming. I'm sure it is global warming. And uh, yes, the, but, uh, so, so where did that, because Judith Curry had had data that showed it was a little bit lower, but let's say it was higher, just for fun. You know, you so, so assuming it was a couple of degrees higher than it was, say, 20 years ago, um, if, if, hypothetically, if Irma took place 20 years ago, same storm, took place 20 years ago, it would have been a category two instead of a category five. And that's I simply because of the way it works on the ocean surface. Hugely speculative. I, I know it uh, is. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it's, it's an interesting kind of comparison. It is, and it would be worth to look at it. But I mean, anybody who does research off a single incident should probably be spanked, OK? <laughs> because you can't make conclusions over single storm. We have these huge oscillations in El Nino, La Nina. We have huge variations in weather. I just find that outrageous that they would take a single storm and spin out some story over a single event. That's why the Pelkey data is, that's why the Pelkey data got Pelkey into so much trouble. <laughs> that's his data right here, you see. <laughs> okay, continue, please. So, I think the question is, um, I, I actually, I am, I'm not a climate denier. I think we have a long-term climate problem. But I think we continue to hurt ourselves if we take every incident and try to tie it to climate and turn it into a political rather than a researchable or technocratic discussion. So that's my big theme on this. Okay, but you'll, dis you'll agree with me, won't you? that we have to be very mindful of the possibility, even if not shown to everyone's satisfaction, um, that these storms could be getting worse. And I, think, I think that the, if, you, if you run a, a real model and you have rising temperatures, you will get more intense storms, but you will get them less frequently. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to take the whole model. You can't just say, and that, to say Irma was caused by, or Harvey was caused by, is just not supported by the historical record. Mm -hmm. I think actually the, that you can get this severity in weather in the future is not unreasonable. It's yeah. not unreasonable. Yeah. But it really weakens your argument if that's the case you're making. Well, I, yes, but you know, to tell you the truth, uh, however many storms we get, um, if they're more severe, they're going to hurt us more. That's, that's bad. That's and bad, and yeah. Hawaii especially but has to worry again, about that. The question is, what should Hawaii be doing? Should yes. they be spending more effort on uh, 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 re resiliency of the uh, housing stock and the emergency services and the be and the and the seawalls, or should they be, you know, playing with very ex expensive and exotic fuels, which may or may not generate much benefit. That's I a really good a question, question. Though. That's a really good question because, you know, resources are not unlimited. Both of these alternatives take money and, you know, resources in general and labor and time and planning and what have you. But let me put it to you this way. I mean, why not do both in moderation? 
You can do lots of things in moderation, but remember, those the resources you put into the politicians' favorite hobby horses aren't <laughs> always the best thing. Right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think you 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 can't you can say you can do both, or why not do everything? But resources in the end are limited, yeah. and people have to make choices. Yeah. And they can make bad ones so as well as good what is ones. your suggestion for Hawaii based on this and based on the fact that you know if if commodities are uh, disrupted by any by right. a, a given storm six thousand miles away, it will have an effect on us somehow so yes. how do we how do we plan against that and 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 I agree of course that it can't all be um, dealing with climate change per se, and that some of it maybe a substantial part has to be dealing with uh, how to preserve uh, your ability uh, to recoup the, re you know, to have, to have the fuel, to have the water, to have the food, and, and so forth. You, you were talking before about the, uh, the stock, the, um, the, the fuel stock, and how in this country we have certain areas uh, where fuel is, is stashed away for a hard time. And uh, what, yeah. what is that relationship of that with Hawaii? So I think this is very interesting. So the, the U.S. has a strategic petroleum reserve. And in fact, the Trump administration, various people in the Trump administration, have either suggested to get rid of it entirely or uh, cut it in half. We have s something in excess of 550 million barrels of crude oil. Now, when you have a storm, of course, it's not, the crude oil is not enough. That's really almost a strategic, you know, if you get cut off from the Middle East or there's a major war terrorism event in one of the world's production centers, it can be released not just to the U.S. but into the world market. Um, I think we also are learning that uh, we need good redundancy in our logistics and our transportation uh, to move these refined products around. It's very interesting. Everybody says, you know, we don't need this gasoline or we can get off of that. You see a storm hit Florida, the first thing people ask, when can I get some gasoline? Absolutely. When can I get the diesel fuel, right? Yeah. So we should be cautious about saying we can throw these fuels away. We don't really need them. We have wind and solar. And that's a very common theme in Washington. You know, well, you see, when a storm hits, you can see how valuable those commodities are. Well, you know, you raise an interesting point because it, were there electric vehicles and were we to, you know, avoid fossil fuel and use uh, solar, for example, as a source uh, of the fuel for electric vehicles, we'd be more resilient. And it's all about, you know, for a lot of people, renewables is about energy security. So shouldn't we go Sorry. down that path? If the power lines go down, you're going to have a trouble moving your electric car around. <laughs> so the one thing about gasoline and diesel fuel is it's distributed power. Mm -hmm. It's very dense, and it's a small package, and it can be moved around a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. If the grid goes down, you're not going to be driving your Tesla for a week. Well, that, but that, that, <laughs> that, uh, that impels you to put, a, put your own solar system and batteries in your <laughs> right. house, which not everybody can afford to do. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, this, I mean, this, is, this is really interesting. To, it's a sort of chilling in a way. Uh, to mm -hmm. look and see what happened there, uh, to see how well we did in some ways, um, yeah. but also to, to be um, careful planners as against the possibility that uh, later storms will be worse. And I think partly right. it's a mindset, isn't it? It's a matter of wrapping your mind around these possibilities and reorganizing your community so you take less of a hit the next time. Right, and it's very hard to get people to prepare for rare events, you know. Yes. So, well, Manana. <laughs> yeah, you heard it here on Think It's true fact because it's not at the top of their list of priorities. No, no. It's so what, what do you expect is going to happen in terms of the national uh, supply system as a result of these storms? Um, what, what, if anything, is happening? What, if anything, is the government doing, or, or for that matter, private industry doing uh, with I regard to the strategic stock? I think there will be a lot otherwise? of... First, it's, we really need a good... We should not lose this opportunity to understand what happened and what what worked in the recovery and what didn't work. I would say the uh, emergency operations of the federal government, and this has nothing to do with Trump, just the bureaucracy itself has gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. They've had a lot of lessons from Katrina and Sandy 
and they sort of understand what needs to happen right away mm -hmm. and move much quick, much more quickly in pre-positioning supplies, in waiving the regulatory regulatory requirements that have a low payoff but potentially more disruptive. So in that sense, we ought to take the time to look at this very carefully, look at uh, you know, what supply systems held up, which didn't, what can we do in the future? Because if you believe these storms are going to be more intense in the future, well, I think we need to put some effort into this. Yeah. And how do you, and this goes to the National Preparedness Disaster Training uh, Center, which is actually mm. across the street from our studio. And it's a federally funded program that uh, tries to train people. But I, you know, I wonder, um, you know, here we have two great object lessons. We have two very important stories. And those guys ought to be referring to them when they go out and train and try to change the way people think, don't you think? Yeah, and I'm sure they will. I'm sure it's going to be. I have no doubt both Irm and Harvey will be studied very carefully. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, I mean, you know, in Houston already from the building codes, almost everybody is now convinced that they built a lot of homes in the wetlands. And that might have been okay, but they didn't, they didn't plan for enough capacity to evacuate the water, you know, the, the canals and the byways. I don't think they built them big enough or strong enough. So. There are going to be a lot of lessons that come out of this. Yeah, and we here in Hawaii, we have to be very aware of this because we have a lot of lowlands. We have climate change as well as storms. And if we have, a, if we have an extreme storm, um, our, our low-lying properties are going to be affected. Mm -hmm. And of course, if our low-lying properties are going to be affected in tourist areas, that's going to have an immediate effect on our economy. Exactly. So we have to be very aware. <laughs> Well, and it should you. be interesting to see somebody must be working on this at the state level, I hope. I hope. <laughs> we join each other on that point. <laughs> Lou Pugliarisi, uh, Energy in America, uh, Eprink, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks from now, and I right. hope there'll be no more significant storms in that period, but we'll find something else to talk about right. in our examination of Energy in America. Thank you, Lou. All right. Thanks, Jay.